Hello, and welcome to the Money Marketing Podcast. I'm Lois Vallely, Chief Reporter. Um, at the end of May, I attended the Initiative for Financial Wellbeing's annual conference in Bristol. Uh, now, financial wellbeing is a topic we at Money Marketing are very passionate about, and we are wanting to focus on more. So off the back of the event, I thought it would be good to chat to a few of the keynote speakers. In the first episode, I spoke to Alison Gray, co-founder of Wealthy, and got some of her thoughts on financial education and how that can help with financial well-being. Um, last episode, I was joined by Dr. Thomas Mather, Insight Manager at Aegon UK's Centre for Behavioural Research. And we spoke quite a lot about sort of how advisors can help adjust people's mindsets to improve their financial well-being. And this episode, I'm going to be speaking to Rohan Sivajotti, um, co-founder of Next Gen Planners, and get some of his thoughts. So thank you for joining me, Rohan. Um, maybe you could start by telling some our listeners a bit about you, about next-gen planners, and why financial well-being is so important to you. Sure thing. Okay, so first of all, you can you can dial all your intellectual tones down from by following a doctor um, and coming on to me. <laughs> so that's great. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So uh, I guess a little bit about me. Um, yeah, studied financial services at uni. Um, Paraplanned, ran an IFA business at twenty-two worked for various various providers and all that on all that side of things after a spot of traveling um set up my own ifa practice at 28 um which i sold last summer last august um and next gen in the meantime has been locked around now for about five or six years um and yeah i'm the director and head of innovation at next gen i was one of the co-founders as well um, and next gen planners is, is effectively um loads of expert training and resources for financial planners in order to level up professionally and personally as well um, and there's a bit of a whistle stop tour for you lois lovely thank you and um just so i've asked the other two to do this as well for the purposes of our conversation yeah. um what is it we are talking what is, what is it we mean by financial well-being what exactly are we talking about yeah, uh, financial well-being, um, from my perspective and from what I know of it and reading, reading around the subject, um, is using your wealth and time, um, et cetera, in order to become happy um, and focusing on things that do make you happy. Um, look at things like social well-being, environmental well-being, uh, as well as the financial side of it, and using all available resources that you have to live a happier and healthier life. And um I, I think that's I think that's I think that's where where I'm at with financial well-being. I know there's been quite a few definitions thrown around, and I think there's um <clears throat> you know there are some companies I think who may use financial well-being as a nice marketing line uh, in order to promote some different agendas. Um, Buzzword. <laughs> yeah, it is a bit, isn't it? Um, but it, effectively, it's the use of the resources that we have to make ourselves happier and healthier. Great. Um, so yeah, when we're talking about financial well-being. Obviously, it's very important um, and fits in, I suppose, with the wider sort of health and well-being agenda that I think has very much come to the fore, considering the COVID pandemic over the past couple of years. Um, what sort of effect do you think that's had on people's, both people's financial stability and also sort of their financial well-being? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> you, you, you'll have seen that if you've ever tried to to get to get a tradesman within the past eighteen months or so, it's incredibly difficult um, because tradesmen are so busy because of the fact that um, you know people are looking at suddenly now spending more time at home looking at the environment around them and trying to improve that environment around them. It's made more of a focus on home life. I'd say less of a focus on work life. Um, but also looking at that balance, you know, are, are you still happy to travel an hour and a half a day on a tube to get to work and then an hour and a half back? Or, you know, could you be spending that time <clears throat> moving from your bedroom to your lounge or your kitchen table or whatever it is um, in order to start your day? And, you know, COVID, I think, and the, the pandemic and the like has really made people focus on what's important to them, um, which I think, you know, is dare I say it, one of the, you know, a silver lining, I guess, um, in that it's, you know, people just aren't quite, I don't think, in, in that rat race as much as they once were. Mm -hmm. um, and effectively, I think that's a good, that's a, a decent thing for society, really, in that if more of us are focusing on what makes us happy and spending more time on that, then that leads for a, a happier and healthier society. Yeah, definitely. Mm. So, and obviously, in the wake of the COVID pandemic, we've had a quite a lot more sort of financial economic upheaval um and it's led to a cost of living crisis um i suppose 
now because most of our listeners are obviously going to be financial advisors um and yeah this is something that i touched on with both alison and thomas as well um what to what extent is it an advisor's duty to ensure their clients are financially well would you say um massively so but what i will say is probably a lot of people listen to this and a lot of financial planners um i would say deal with the top few percent in society in terms of wealth and money um is an energy bill going up by a few hundred pounds a year going to affect a lot of financial planners clients probably not um you know we have to we have to take stock sometimes and you know just acknowledge the majority of people that financial planners deal with are wealthy and it's not going to be too much of a shock to them um therefore you know in 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 times like this it often is those most needy in society that get hit the most um so what could we do as a profession and what could advisors do more um definitely more pro bono work um work with underprivileged communities um people on the, the other end of that scale um I think would be a really noble thing to do right now because people do need that help. Um, I mean, I, I saw that thing the other day. It was extraordinary, wasn't it? Where um, I was listening to the radio and they were talking about people donating to food banks and saying, um, you know, don't donate anything to food banks that requires heating up because that costs people energy, you know, and that's an extraordinary thing in itself. You know, imagine having to go to a food bank to get food, but then having to pick food that, you could just eat fresh out of a can or fresh out of a packet. Um, you know, there are people in in real need, um, and the majority of clients are not going to be affected. So, um, perhaps use some time and some resource to help those that are most needy and really need it. Is what I'd say. Mm, yeah, definitely. No, it's a. I always feel um, sort of certainly in times like this, it's it's very we're very privileged to be in the category where sort of it's just a bit annoying rather than actually life threatening. <laughs> yeah, totally. I, I, I think by it's very, very virtue. If you're listening to the money marketing podcast, you're probably in the top few percent of society. It's just how it is. It's, um, but even it's, it's the sort not, of yeah, circles, it's, circles that, 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 that we're in. Um, it's, it's, you know, yeah, it, it, that, 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 that was a good way of putting it more of an inconvenience than a, yeah, an inconvenience. Yeah, than a, than a, than a life threatening situation. So mm. I would put myself in the top percentage, but yeah, even for me, just like in the sort of middle ground, it's yeah, an inconvenience, but, um, just terrible for people at, at the very lower end. Yes. Um, so yeah, I think it sort of almost goes beyond financial well being into actually being able to live kind of thing yeah it's still i mean it's, it's still it's still well-being it's it's just a different a different end of well-being um mm -hmm. you know it's you know a lot of financial well-being is using your money and your resources to make you happier when well, people don't have money or resources it's it's trying to effectively help people with with what little money they have what little resource they have to make the most of it for their well-being and people need guidance and help with that so um look, anything that people can do to help that those people in society, I think, would be really noble right now. Yeah, definitely. And in terms of um, sort of financial well-being generally, um, again, this is something I spoke about in the previous couple of episodes. Um, how big a role do you think um, education should play in that? Because obviously, there's, as I've said previously, there's quite a lot of sort of education tools out there for people. Um, but sometimes, even if people no, they should do something or shouldn't do something. It doesn't mean that they will or won't. So how much do you think we need financial education and how much is it more sort of trying to adjust people's mindsets? Mm, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, so my argument with this is, is that you know nobody wakes up in the morning and goes, you know, I want to be educated on financial well-being. Or I want to know what an ISA is, or you know, mm -hmm. they open the curtains and go, I wish I knew what a pension was. You know, those those aren't really things and problems and challenges in people's lives. And effectively, that's why they pay financial planners to look at. Like you guys, are the guys that know this stuff, and that's why they pay you to to know that. You know, I wouldn't. Um, expect to pay a plumber to come around here and fix something and then to be explained every single part of it and educated on how it's been done and all of that and um, i just want to pay for the work to be done and the work to be completed to a good standard and so it but the education piece i guess falls on the other side of things in that um i think you know the more financial planners and financial advisors that are educated around financial well-being then that message cascades down and their clients become 
happier, healthier, wealthier, all the rest of it. So if the education focuses more on the advisory community itself as opposed to end client, um, then I think that works really well. And I think that's where you get your 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 gains really because if you can you know educate one financial planner who's genuinely interested in the subject because it's finance it's where they are anyway mm. um and they can pass that on to their 80 to 100 clients or whatever that they look after then that's um a better way to reach more people than to effectively trying to go out and educate every single person out there who just may not be that interested to be honest um hence why they outsource it to someone else so um, it's trying to find, you know, it's trying to use the resource to have the maximum amount of impact from a societal effect. Um, but again, ensuring that it's not just financial planning clients that benefit from it, but other areas of society too. Yeah, definitely. What are, what, what are some of the ways that you think people can, uh, advisors can do that then trying to sort of access not just the top tier of mm. um, sort of the most aff- affluent people, but everyone in society? Um, by speaking to charities most of the time and um, if you if you speak to a number of local charities they're always um looking out for support <clears throat> um, for various projects for people in need that kind of thing um you know uh, talking to debt charities things like that i think that's a superb ways of going about it as well um there's charities like the money charity you know they've got some superb resources that uh, can be can be utilized and, and uh, the like there are plenty of ways to get involved it's just mm. um it's ju- it's just going out there and uh, and having those conversations really and finding them great um i did just want to ask finally mm. why is it important for you to be part of something like the initiative for financial well-being yeah um because it's, it is it is a great cause um it's something that is evidently a not-for-profit um it's something that is improving the landscape in financial services. And that's, you know, that's effectively what, what Next Gen Planners is about, is anything that improves the landscape in financial services, um, increases diversity within it, increases quality within it and the like, is a friend of ours. And, um, you know, the, we've, we, we've always supported the IFW pretty much from, from, the, from the start and will continue to do so because it's having a positive net effect on the profession. Um, and anything that's having a positive effect, more than happy to get behind. And um, they're doing some really good work and it, it was a pleasure to be involved in conference this year. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Rohan, so much for joining me. I've had a great time chatting to you today. Um, and to our listeners, please do keep up to date with all our new releases via Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else that you get your podcasts from. You can also find all our new content published on the Money Marketing website, as well as Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. I hope you enjoyed our mini-series looking at financial well-being. Thank you very much for listening. 